Okay, so um, we'll begin today by wrapping up the I.O. lecture, and we might as well do a bit of uh, revision as we go as well. So let's start with the review part, and we'll talk about each of the I.O.s in general. Actually, at the end of this lecture, after we go through the, the time section of the material, I'll also show you some very basic Arduino programming here. And what's very nice, I think, about embedded systems like this is you'll see all this stuff very directly. So like, there's not a lot of semantic sugar, even on Arduino, between you and these functions. So you'll see GPIO use and ADC use, and it really is like a one-to-one -one mapping that you can easily recognize back from the course materials. So we had GPIO, first of all. General purpose I.O., this is um, digitally encoded ones and zeros. Um, a little bit of um, finesse there, because, um, excuse me, we have different states we can set these things into. Uh, they can either be used as outputs or inputs. In the case that they're used as inputs, then normally we're going to connect them to something called a pull-up resistor which means that unless the communicating phenomena or device has um, you know, actively controlled the pin, it has a known value. Without doing that, uh, the pin will, will float. It could be a one, it could be a zero. There's no real reason to suspect you're gonna get either one of those two things out of the pin. It's a common thing you'll do you know, when you're first setting up your I.O. in your project and stuff, or maybe the ADC. You'll end up leaving something unconnected or in a weird state. And any time you get a value and you just see kind of an oscillating value, that's what you've done somewhere for sure. Or it's just the wrong pin. That's super common as well. Logic levels are kind of dull, so we'll leave those. You'll see the ADC later. Who can tell me real quick what the ADC is for? I heard someone say analog to digital converter, yes. Absolutely. So we quantify an analog voltage level. Every th the only things that we talk to on our microcontroller in silicon are always electrical. So everything we'll, we'll, we will deal with is about current and voltage. Um, but current is also inferred from different voltage levels and so on. So it's always going to be voltage in some way under the hood, even for our digital IOs, if you dig deep enough. This is something to remember. Um, basically, like because we're quantizing uh, a range, first of all, we, we, we have to consider what the range is. Is your Arduino 5 volts or 3 volts? That will make a, a difference to what a reading of 512 coming off your ADC means. The second thing that's interesting for the ADC is its resolution, how many um, categories we make across that range, if you like, how many bins. Uh, your Arduino is a 10-bit ADC. So you get two to the power 10 possibilities. The, the specific numbers don't matter too much. Don't bother to memorize those. You'll need to know them when you're coding. But for an exam or something, it doesn't matter about the specifics of a chip. DAC's just the opposite. Unfortunately, we can't do good demos because it's not on your Arduino. But DAC's actually really cool. Just lets you manipulate a voltage level in the same way. It's actually just a little bit harder to build a DAC. So for boring reasons, these are usually not as high res as these. Um, when you get them built into a micro. Skip over PWM for now. Then we get to our kind of digital interconnects. We looked at um, three in some detail. The first was UART. Can anyone remember an advantage of UART compared to the others? There's tons of disadvantages too. But it has one good thing about it. It has a low pin count. I'm going to make you answer soon as well. Um, so you, only f you, you always need to connect a ground line between any two things that communicate. But apart from that, you just have uh, a transmit and receive line on UART. You've agreed some timings. And so if you pull it high and pu uh, low, in the, you can signal ones and zeros across the top of it. We then looked at a different interconnect 
called Spy. So someone really has to answer now. What was good about Spybus compared to UART? Um, separate clock, so it's convenient. Spy, indeed. Sorry, go ahead. And uh, that's why you can be very sure that the receiver will actually receive whatever the information is. That's correct. So Spybus adds a clock line. So remember, we like having very few lines. If we can, that's good. If you ever build a PCB, it is a pain if you have to keep, you know, route a lot of lines. But a clock line is a really good idea if you want to run fast between two things which don't have a common clock. And the lack of a common clock, by the way, we'll come back to later, is everywhere in these systems. And it's actually a really difficult problem once things get onto a network instead of just local interconnects. But we can easily solve it here. So for the next two, we had SPY and we had I squared C, those both add that clock line. And the big difference here is, like on serial port, we'd have to make sure our clocks were close enough to agree that now we're, it, we're, um, uh, we're moving to the next uh, phase of signaling ones and zeros. Um, if I say, I'm sending you a bit every time by oscillating my clock line, you can easily see whether the other line was high and low. So hopefully it's clear it makes it a lot easier. Spy also had this notion of slave um, select. So slave select is just kind of like an on, you can think of it as an on switch for your peripherals. Um, if you don't toggle the slave select, a peripheral won't answer. So this is kind of neat because it means, if you think about those wires, right, we connect our clock and data lines to as many peripherals as we want, the same, peripher the same peripherals. That reduces overall kind of complexity of routing those lines. But uh, we do need a per peripheral slave select. So you've got one pin per thing, and then they can all share the same uh, data lines and clock lines. That's OK, because only one will talk at a time on SPY. Moving along then, we get to our, our last of this type of interconnects, these kind of common microcontroller uh, hookups. We have I squared C. So somebody else, what was? The coolest thing about I squared C. Uh, addressable, so you can address different components. Indeed, so it has seven bit addresses. This is pretty, and also I think as a computer scientist, it immediately, immediately makes it more recognizable. Oh, it's a network, it has addresses. Devices only respond to their address. There's even a broadcast address, although it's not really used too much, to be honest. So the cool thing about I squared C is you have very few lines. So you have the clock line, and then you have this half duplex data line. They, you could equally add a, a second line so it can go full duplex, sending and receiving at the same time. But I squared C doesn't. It's striving to be um, a really extensible low pin count bus. Because um, it's half duplex, it's not as fast as SPY. Um, that's its major limitation. But on the other hand, um, we can add as many peripherals as we want. You can build software for um, an I squared C slave device as well as for a master. So normally, if you're doing kind of Arduino programming in the early days, it will be the master. And you'll have some sensors or something like that you want to grab data from. You can equally use a microcontroller to um, you know, deliver some kind of more complex sensor. And then you'd be building the slave logic as well. So you can end up doing both. Kind of sucky thing, so the, the theory is very nice for I squared C, but the actual assignment of these addresses is kind of um, a zoo. So, you know, the device will have a couple addresses normally it can support, and you'll solder some different bits to decide between A and B. So it's, there's no notion here of dynamic I squared C addressing. It's not like DHCP where you can all get your own session address or something like that. Um, we've built such a system for our spin-off VersaSense because they have so many different sensors. But it's not normal. That's kind of a weird kind of thing to do. And that brings me to where we left off. Didn't quite finish. So the only other thing that is interesting to talk about here, I would say, are um, the special purpose interconnects that are used for programming these chips and manipulating them um, in development environments. By far the most common one that you'll see is JTAG. Although, it, again, it's another zoo. So microchip have their own dedicated programmers. Um, I was going to say um, uh, Atmel do as well, but those companies have now merged. Um, 
Nordic will have dedicated programmers. There are many different standards. So just think of this as an example of a programmer standard so we can talk about what it does. Um, so JTAG will let you flash programs onto the chips. There's other ways to do this too for many chips that are simpler. But it will also enable you to um, control that ch chip in deeper ways. So you can connect it up to a debugging environment and do the kind of testing that you might have done in like kind of a Java IDE or something like that before. You know where you insert breakpoints and you can see where you are. JTAG will typically let you do things like program areas of memory. So not just the whole chip, like an Arduino flasher where it's add a new program now. It will let you analyze what is there, replace select chunks, and just play around at that deep level, basically. Normally extract, re extract register maps. So if you're in a weird state, you can kind of see a snapshot of what's going on in the whole chip. You can go very far without really needing all of this in today's embedded systems, to be honest with you. Now we get to uh, the actual board that you guys will be using. So you'll end up with, we won't go through all of this, it's pointless, it's just a, it's one example always. But um, you'll have this open on your PC somewhere and you'll need to keep checking the uh, what's on these different pins here and make sure you have stuff hooked up right when your code isn't working. This is actually the board you'll be using. So just to give you a quick overview, it's a standard Arduino processor more or less. The 32U4 is one that just has USB built in as well. So I didn't mention USB as an embedded interconnect. You all know USB, I hope. But these chips increasingly do have USB client support as well. Like it's, there's no reason you can't do that as long as your micro is capable enough. And that's nice because you can then build a bootloader right here. We talked about bootloaders in the memory uh, part of the course, which can sit there listening for USB connections and direct from your PC then you can transfer your program. No need for JTAG if you're just putting a program on there which is great for your assignment because we don't have to give you a big programmer or anything. You know, keeps it easy for us. As you can see, um, you'll recognize, if you can see it at all, a lot of the uh, codes here for things like the here's uh, MISO and MOSI, serial clock lines from our SPI and I squared C buses. Anything labeled DIO, these are GPIOs in Arduino space and Anything with a green box here is an analog pin. So all of these can read analog voltages, the green ones. Um, every pin, which is not something special like reset or let's say I squared C can, I think even the I squared C pins can be used as GPIO, but except for the special purpose pins, everything else can sense ones and zeros. Um, I don't know if it's shown here. Yes. So. There's a little distinction we didn't talk about yet here, which is these interrupt pins. Now, we'll talk about interrupts today. An interrupt is a way of triggering some code when, on an event in the real world, rather than having your code be scheduled internally. So up until now, most code you've written, you know, you kind of, it's going to be driven by input from the user. It's true, but you don't have to think about like the keyboard press or anything like this when you write it. It's just, it's always on and alive. Here, our code frequently isn't on or alive or needs to make very quick state changes. And so we'll direct, directly manipulate interrupts. Just think like a switch, for example, you know? You're gonna change a screen if you hit a button. That's an ideal interrupt-driven piece of code. The pins that are labeled int with this dark gray are special interrupts that can wake you from the deepest sleep modes. Not everything else can. Every other pin can also detect those changes. That's possible. But on the app mega specifically, there's like this weird two-level distinction between the interrupts. So there's two ones that are really easy to use. I think you can use all of the others as well, but it takes a little bit more uh, noodling around in the code. So that more or less brings us to the end of the I.O. lecture. This is the, the verse sense thing I keep mentioning here and there. Uh, what that spin-off did was make these mesh networked sensor hubs, which have these real plug and play sensors. But again, I think it's interesting to note that, you know, these buses are increasingly being connected to do kind of traditional expansion boards on Pis, on Arduinos and stuff. So while they were all originally intended to connect like 
PCBs which were fixed at manufacture time, they don't have to be. And so they're increasingly being used to do this kind of plug and play stuff as well. So there's some reading for this section. I think it is good to scan the reading. So it's a good, so on the one hand, like I always say, it's a different way of saying what I say. So if you don't get what I'm saying, then this will help. But it's a good test too. So if you think you know the lectures already, scan the book and, and it should all make sense to you. Nothing should look super weird. Then you know you're doing pretty good. Any questions on IO before we hop into time? No, nope, everyone kind of gets it. Cool. All right. So, time is a weird kind of title for a computer science lecture. Um, this lecture deals with the lowest level aspects of time. Later on, we'll do real-time scheduling, and Yolanda will also talk about, um, what's the word? So I'll, I'll begin by doing a nuts and bolts uh, real embedded real-time lecture, and then Yolanda will go a little bit further into real-time scheduling. But this isn't any of that, so this is just about how time actually works on these microcontrollers. We'll begin with the clock sources that we have. Um, so the clock is going to be really, really important to us. They have different properties, just like I.O. They take different amounts of energy to run. They have different accuracies um, and things like this. The most kind of crummy and basic sort of clock source that we can have is something like an RC oscillator. Um, and an RC oscillator, is something, importantly, is something we can build in silicon. So when you make a chip, you can put an RC oscillator on it without adding any extra components. And this is neat, because it means that, you know, if you take these Ar Arduinos, for example, if I had a big one and I clipped some cables to the legs of the chip, I could already start working. I actually don't even need the board. The board is just for convenience to add some things. So RC oscillators are great like that. Um, Almost every microcontroller will, will, embed, will embed them. Typically, they're not very accurate. And the reason is that the, the underlying circuit, which you don't have to memorize either, this is just to show you a little bit under the hood how it works, is composed of a set of resistors, an amplifier, and a set of capacitors, which are arranged to give you this oscillating signal. That's great. But resistors and capacitors being analog components are not terribly accurate. So um, if you're looking at an RC oscillator that's uncalibrated, you'll have multiple percent kind of inaccuracies. You can calibrate, uh, and so what you can do is you can make it, even though these values are inaccurate, and then you can do some testing on it. And you can say, OK, well, I know what the, uh, I know what the real values of these now are and how fast it runs, so I will update like a, let's say, a read-only register or something on my chip, and that will contain some calibration information. So I can also get rid of the kind of the broad manufacture time variance in these things. So you can make it a little bit better that way. Well, actually, quite a lot better. But there's another important factor here, which is that these things are also impacted uh, by things like the voltage level that the chip runs at. Um, if you have a battery that's running dead, that might be a problem for you. They're also, or if you're running from like, you know, an environmental source like solar, you may go way up and down. In addition, things like temperature affect the rate at which these os oscillators run. They do, actually all oscillators are affected by those two things, I think, in fact, voltage and temperature. But uh, in these cases, the effects tend to be bigger. So what that means is that literally if you had like two devices and it's a, it's a nice summer day and you put one in the basement and you put one in the sun, they'll run at different speeds. And so if you want to get them to do something together, then they'll drift apart over time and it gets really hard. Um, crystal oscillators are better. So crystal oscillators use the mechanical resonance frequency of some form of crystal or the piezoelectric material. Um, typically, crystal is, is common. It's good. We've been using it for ages. Um, and these are more accurate, generally speaking, than the RC-type oscillators that you can put on a chip. 
But unfortunately, um, they're a separate material. It's not possible to manufacture them in a chip. That doesn't make any sense at all. So you're going to have to have now, for the first time, a board and at least one extra component on your micro if you want to have nice, accurate timing. And that's your crystal. And it's associated passives. Oh, if I say passives, by the way, just like that's large, you know, like resistors and capacitors and stuff like this that you need for boring reasons. Uh, the frequency of these things is determined by the physical properties, the cut and the trim. Um, but as I say, so these are great. We basically always use them if we have a radio, but they do make our boards bigger and so on. Um, it's, so, it's considered so important that we be able to get rid of these things. The whole research trajectories, for example, at UC Berkeley are invested in um, being able to eliminate um, special purpose oscillators for radio communication. So for our normal processor, oftentimes, we can get away with the RC oscillator. Like Your code isn't going to be incorrect if it's uh, running on a timer from an RC oscillator, right? But if you want to generate a carrier wave or something for your radio, then that has to be exactly right. And so it's when we hit communication that these things become critical. And the guys at Berkeley aren't idiots. It might seem like a kind of niche issue. But if you could really just get rid of these, then the, the, price, the, the long term pricing and size of like radio modules could theoretically collapse significantly. So it sounds super boring, I think, at first blush, but it is important. And um, uh, there are people out there working on it. Move it, forgetting about radios and stuff like this for now and thinking more about our software, we also have the option of like dedicated clock chips, which can often be very attractive because they do a lot of hard work for you, basically. So on a real-time clock, an RTC, we have the same exact setup. It's, it's a chip, of course. It might have an RC oscillator. It might also embed a, if it's a module, it might have its own silicon oscillator or whatever on there. Um, but they'll have done the hard work of like calibrating it, giving you a guaranteed accuracy. You'll connect to it via one of those nice buses that we just saw. Like I squared C is very common for clocks because clocks don't have to run really fast or anything like that. And you're only transferring little bits of data, set an alarm, um, check the current real world time, and so on. And that's maybe the most important uh, point for real time clocks. On your microcontroller, you have all these timers, and so you can build like perfect schedules, no problem. But it's really hard to build in a piece of embedded code three months from now at 2.15, wake up and do something. Like, that's, that's not so easy at all, and you have to store a whole bunch of data to do it. RTCs typically kind of take away that pain as well. So they will run on human-readable time, kind of like Linux timestamps. It's all going to have some kind of standard UTC thing there. You can do exactly that, wake me up once a day at this exact human readable time. Skip the weekends, things, RTCs love things like this. Um, include leap years, don't make me worry about that. All that kind of junk you wouldn't want to care about. Um, they can also be used to produce pulses at spe fixed specific times. These are not oscillator replacements, so you wouldn't clock your microcontroller from them. That would be very strange. But you might, for example, set up um, an interrupt signal from it running once every 10 seconds. If you had a, like a sensor and you wanted to put it into deep sleep mode and then send a temperature reading every 10 seconds, an RTC is pretty great for that. That's a good idea. Like everything else, if you specialize, you can be really good. So typically, the best RTCs that you can go and buy have much lower power consumption than your microcontroller will have in sleep mode. So I don't know where the 30 nanoamps came from anymore, but we have one we use today in the lab, which is only 12 nanoamps. So um, you might be able to, if, you're, if you work really hard, you might be able to push the sleep mode of your Arduino down under a microamp. I actually think that's not even possible. Um, think something like a thousand times more current than a, a really good RTC. So they, um, again, can be very interesting because that deep sleep current becomes really low, very accurate, a lot of development effort goes away. But you're paying you know, many tens of cents for a significant sized module, and that's the downside, basically. Ah, oh, I answered this question. That sucks. So I said already, saved you for a math to answer. 
But I squared C is ideal for something like this. Um, you could use SPY to connect your RTC, but like, why bother? SPY, remember, has a couple more lines. Did you need it to run fast when you set that alarm? No. Did you need it to run fast when you, I don't know, checked what the human readable time was? No. So that's kind of a good way to decide between those buses. Like, if you don't need to go fast, uh, then might as well have the low pin count. Take I squared C. If you need to go fast, probably take SPY. Um, and UART, is, you kind of only end up in really when it's kind of like connecting to some, we have UART transceivers on mainstream things. So that, that's why we typically use them there. Um, I don't think the voltage note is too, uh, once, if you get deep into kind of um, building energy harvesting stuff or long life stuff, the fact that your RTC can run at a lower voltage than your micro is handy. But for you guys, it's not terribly important. So I, I mentioned this already, but let's take a look at how bad it can be. If we take um, our crystal oscillators, and I pulled these numbers from, I, I probably literally looked on DigiKey, but I'll pull them from something we, ha we use in the lab. So we have typical ac accuracies here of in the order of 0.005% for a crystal oscillator. On the other hand, our RC oscillator is something like plus minus 2%. Again, your code will run fine. It won't know the difference, of course. It runs 2% quicker or slower, your, your code doesn't know. It's all about things you're interacting with or stuff happening in the real world. That's where the problems come from. But think about this, plus minus 2%. In the worst case, over a one month period, that RC oscillator is gonna drift by 14 hours. So plus minus 2% might not seem like a lot, but if you have a long running system, it quickly leads to like insane craziness. Um, I think I spoke over most of this. You can do a lot of calibration here. I think we used to do it in the assignment, but I, I think we've scrapped it. Ashok will tell you next week. Um, in the case of the, um, the app megas that are used on the Arduinos, you can use, for example, the internal temperature sensor. And if you like, you can do kind of additional code at the application level where you'll check the temperature and you'll adjust how many ticks you're doing uh, to make the, the clock more accurate, things like this. You can also do a basic calibration uh, as well if the chip hasn't been calibrated at manuf excuse me, um, if it hasn't been, um, yeah, I guess it's still calibrated, calibrated at manufacture time. Well, I think, I hope you all know the answer to this question. So what would be, what, what, which of our embedded buses will be most sensitive to this problem? Somebody has to actually say, somebody who hasn't said yet, this is an easy one. Somebody from the second row. So we've got one embedded bus that's gonna be sensitive to all these oscillator problems. I'm gonna pick somebody. How about you? So which of the embedded buses is gonna be most sensitive to our clock drift? It's your first class. Okay, no worries. Somebody else? Come on. I know you know the answer. Okay, how about you? No worries. Okay, it's like I am Spartacus type situation here. You know if you don't all answer, then I can't keep doing this. It's fair enough. It's the UART, right? So remember, if it has a clock line, it's like the code. You don't care. Why don't you care? Because um, the clock may be plus minus 2% inaccurate, but if I'm giving it to you, that doesn't matter when I signal my ones and zeros. They're, they're happening at a different rate, but, but you don't care. If your clock and my clock are 2% inaccurate, and we don't have a clock line, then over time I start to miss whether I sh I'm on the current one and, or zero or the next one, and we, and we drift apart, and our serial lines can't work. This has a very direct impact on the Arduinos. It's not, so it, if you build a system, this happens for sure, but you know, just on the Arduinos, we build boards all the time, and you can buy them without an oscillator on, like really kind of burr boards, because you want to do some low power stuff maybe. Um, and in those cases, the serial port has to be clocked lower because um, 
The inaccuracy of the, the clock here means you can't support those higher board rates. So, how do we correct for clock drift? Now we get to a more computer science-y problem. Um, well, the clock line is a great answer. So if it's just about communication, take a clock line, that's great. Now your devices are completely synced, and it doesn't matter if the clocks drift a little. If we have network systems, the problem becomes much more complex. So um, wireless network systems, I should really say here. So you don't have in, uh, in wireless different lines. There's no such concept that we can make. You only have one communication method on one frequency, and we'll keep it simple, on one frequency, typically, right? So we cannot put a clock line on there along with our data in a meaningful way. Uh, we, can, we can put whatever information we want onto the air, but that's what we see at the other side. So that means that um, if we want to keep two nodes in sync, we need to kind of build some kind of beaconing system is the common way. So whether it's crystal oscillators or whether it's uh, RC oscillators, if we want to have a couple network nodes go to sleep or, you know, kind of, if they can ever be turned off, but be able to keep talking on a network, then we'll have one of them send out these periodic beacons. Generally speaking, the way beaconing works is always that the master device, the gateway, will always send out its clock. You never care about the, the, the slave devices, the leaf devices clock. They should all be brought into sync with one thing. What is that thing? It's always the gateway, right? So in a beaconing approach, the gateway will send its clock at a certain uh, rate, and everyone else will look at their clock, and then we do two things. We say, what is the current value? Did I run too fast or did I run too slow? And then we trim it. So if we were running too fast, we make an adjustment in our sleep time for how many ticks we're going to wait. And the same thing if we run too slow. So if we run too fast, we'll add a little sleep time. We run too slow, we'll take a little away. The worse your oscillator, the more often you have to beacon. The better your oscillator, the, the, the less, and so on. Um, this is not normally a problem in uh, networks where you have ample power, because in those cases, you can just well, I suppose, no, in, in things like Wi-Fi, for example, there's no version of this problem because you, you can be on and listening all the time. But again, if we turn off our devices for long periods, then again, once they wake up, they have to, to pull back into sync. Okay, so that brings me to the concept of interrupts. So I keep talking about going to sleep. Um, that's not all interrupts are use, used for, but it's one of the most useful things for low power systems. The other thing that we use interrupts for is to just react quickly as well. So you can imagine um, you're doing, let's say, the encryption of a block of data. We do that on embedded systems all the time, something that's uh, long lived. But when someone presses emergency stop, the conveyor belt really should stop. The emergency stop should be coded as an interrupt. So whatever else is happening in your code, when someone hits that button, we're going to jump right to the correct function, and we're going to execute that function. Um, and this basically gets over the problem that our software is inherently sequential, but our physical world, things happen in random orders. Interrupts are probably the hardest thing you'll do in the assignment. There's two hard bits to it. So one bit is just getting the sleep modes right. That can be brute forced. So there are some registers you have to set. You can see them in the data sheet. It's a line of code to set them. Eventually, you get it right. Um, interrupts are you know, more of a skill um, to write. The problem with, with interrupts tends to be that if they go wrong, then your crashes can be kind of catastrophic. So until you have them kind of running correctly, Quite often, the output you get is like nothing. Um, so that's not so easy. Um, but I think this is probably one of the few places that you code them, in my opinion, still. Do you do interrupts in other courses? Nope. They're not so difficult. I actually find them real, really fun. So um, our interrupt is based around an interrupt service routine, or an ISR, an interrupt handler. And an interrupt handler in code is just going to be, for you guys, a function, right? 
Um, and so you can imagine that we have an emergency stop function that will be tied to that button. We have different kind of things that can trigger it. So we have hardware interrupts. These are what I've talked about so far. Think a pin going high, a pin going low. Um, a pin changing state is also often uh, a hardware level interrupt. We have software interrupts that can happen. Um, how far you can go with this depends on your chip, but quite often you, you might have, for example, um, a piece of software which wants to, let's say, move to a safe shutdown mode. And then it's useful to be able to trigger a software interrupt, which will cause that mode to happen quickly. I think on the AVR you don't have this possibility. I'm sure you could kind of hack it, but I don't think there's a way to generate an interrupt from a piece of intelligent code on there. Timer interrupts are also, uh, I guess they sit between the two. So a timer interrupt is a hardware interrupt in the sense that it's going to come from the chip, but it's, it's software driven because you're going to configure a certain counter um, or something like this. So when it counts down to zero, you'll get that interrupt. So you control the registers that uh, inform this uh, timer but it comes, it comes really from hardware as well. You also have a bunch of exceptions um, that can be triggered. One of the most common ones for these would be violations of uh, memory protection, things like that. Um, these can all generate interrupts as well. On the app mega, um, when you get errors in interrupts, generally what happens is it will jump to the reset location. So like all the code for your program starts at uh, literally zero, zero in the flash. Things go wrong here at any point in the Arduino. All it does is dump you back to the reset location. So again, that's a good tip. You put your interrupt code in there and the node is resetting, it's broken code. Right, so um, we don't always want to respond to interrupts. That's kind of an important point. So there are many in operations which, if they were interrupted, could cause problems. Think about writing a program to Flash. So you're, imagine you're a bootloader, you're writing that program. If that process could be interrupted, well, that could be disastrous because when you resume, the program is nonsense now and then it, it won't work anymore. But there are other examples too. Um, generally, important stuff that takes more than a single cycle should not be interrupted. You can control whether interrupts are on or off using these two commands, um, which determine whether the interrupts are enabled or disabled. When they're on, under the hood, what will happen is uh, when a pin is triggered, the chip will jump to basically to, a, to an interrupt uh, vector, which contains an address where it should go to handle this occurrence, right? So your function, emergency stop, will have a certain location in memory. This is abstracted from you. You don't need to worry about that specific. But once you add it as the interrupt handler, its location gets put into the interrupt vector. And that means that when your hardware thing happens, the pin goes high, low, changes, then it will jump to your software. Um, if you were to look at the assembler, you could write that assembly or to write it yourself, that's exactly what you would do. Um, in the case that you do not implement the matching ISR, that's when your MCU will reset. So a very common bug when you're writing your first interrupt handlers is you don't get the, you don't have the names matching right, you don't have uh, or something like this, then your node will, your chip will reset rather than doing anything else. Another issue is nested interrupts. So and should you be able to interrupt uh, an interrupt? Uh, the answer is only if you really know what you're doing. So by default, good practice is that you shouldn't do nested interrupts. There's limited stack space and things like this for the interrupt functions. So if you have uncontrolled uh, nested interrupts, then you can end up in strange states. You can also end up in states you kind of can't escape. If, if imagine that you built an interrupt which could somehow give rise to something that would interrupt it. Well, you could end up stuck in a weird kind of loop. That's possible, too. Um, so I have written code like this. If you, if you write more complex state machines, you may, too. But it needs to be done with Kerr. You basically need to be able to look at the, the real world and say, 
no, the, the second interrupt that I'm looking at here could never possibly um, happen in a way I don't expect. So a little bit more about interrupts. Um, generally speaking, you, shouldn't, you should use them where necessary only. If it doesn't need to be an interrupt, it shouldn't be. They should be kept short. So um, you've got to remember that whatever else was happening is interrupted and stopped when your interrupt is running. So it's good practice for that interrupt to be as short as possible. Um, that will give you better performance. The, code, the normal sequential code will, will run more smoothly and so on and so forth. Um, generally speaking, like everything, all of the code that, that you can possibly move out of the interrupt, you will. So it will really have the absolute minimal logic there. Um, it's good if you're doing, if you're doing in anything except the simplest level of interrupt. If, if there's only one interrupt in your system, most of this doesn't apply. Like if it's just push button light lead, then obviously you're OK. Beyond that, you should really have a state machine. So you know um, what state you're in at any given time. Ah, yes. It's also really important to declare any global variables that you're using in your interrupt is volatile. So why is that? Well, the compiler uh, will look and check how and when these variables might be updated. But the compiler doesn't understand your interrupts. So if you tag them volatile, that me makes sure that the, the variables are always kept up to date, even in the case of using interrupts. If you don't, then they won't necessarily be. And you can end up with strange results. Um, this is kind of always true. If you're using data buffers, be uh, careful with overflows. Most people say that you should not call functions from your ISR. So you're kind of getting a vibe now that pe you know, what people like is very short, completely in line, deterministic code. Uh, in my opinion, you can, if you're very careful, if you have small functions, you can call them in your ISR. It's not that they won't work. This is just kind of considered best practices. Um, Sort of also an excuse for embedded guys to kind of reject all modern programming techniques and insist that you write as though it were just, you know, kind of old school assembler. Understand latency, aiming for fixed time interrupts. This is really nice if you can do it. So the worst kind of interrupt you can have takes a long time, but variable time too. So like in, your, in the operation of your system, stuff can happen, unpredictable from the environment, and cause variable delays. And then finally, you should be clear about what's the background. What is the background thing here, and what is the main thing? So what I mean by that is, like, you can, your embedded system can have many jobs. They're not typically all of the same. kind of links back to the first thing, in a way. They're not all of the same priority. You've really got to decide you have, like, your core logic and then the things that happen around it and try and structure it like that. We're not building a drone here. So honestly, I think this is... This is uh, not going to be terribly complicated for your assignments. Any questions on interrupts before I move on to, to timers? I'll show you some in a bit. They're not that complicated. So your timers under the hood are all bait. So this is from the book. I won't read it verbatim. But generally, you have what's called a programmable interrupt timer. You have a memory mapped register. We talked about registers a few lectures ago. You're going to um, set the speed of a clock, uh, normally on a modern micro. You're going to write into that register a value. And that value will get under the hood. You don't touch it. It happens asynchronously. It's going to get decremented. When it hits 0, um, it can do both ways. So it can, when it overflows or when it hits 0, either way, it's going to trigger an interrupt in your code. So these programmable interrupt timers, because they execute uh, behind our code, can let us do low power sleep modes now, which is really useful. So what we can do is we can say, um, we can say I'm about to go into a very low power mode, turn off all the chip peripherals, turn off the main clock, just keep a secondary low power clock running, and when I wake, call my wake up function at which point you can do whatever it is that you want to do. What else to say here? It's a big piece of text to say just that. Let me just check. I 
think that says it. Okay. Any questions on timers? No? Then what we will do is we will take a five-minute break while I grab a coffee. And in the next bit of the lecture, we're going to see some code examples. So if it goes very quick and you guys seem to either be very bored or find it very easy, then I might move on to the next lecture. We'll see. Um, so it's, I, I, I don't like to do kind of code examples on slides. So what I will do is I'll just go to some, I'll, I'll show you the IDE. I'll go to some examples and I will show you how to run stuff. I know that's also not thrilling if you're sitting there without your own hardware. So um, questions are definitely a good thing here. So the more you can say, oh, I don't get what that bit of code is. Why does it look like that? The less boring it will be for all of us. But we'll see how well that works. OK, so five minutes, and we'll restart.
Okay, so as I said, I think that the, the programming stuff, the very best way to, to learn this stuff is obviously to do it. Um, we begin the practical sessions next week. They, they happen here. You're all going to have your own kit for the assignment, which I believe is in groups of three, uh, but you'll hear more about that from the practical team starting next week. In your kit, you'll have like a mini lab almost. So you have a couple of devices which are gonna run a networked program. Again, I'll leave the details of the assignment for next week. Uh, but you'll also have a multimeter that lets you test. It's a, it's a decent low power multimeter. So you can test lo, uh, the current of your device, see how low power it is. And your goal is gonna be to build a system that reacts in a fixed time to these networked um, events, but one that's as low power as possible. So at the end of the assignment, you'll literally have the multimeter hooked up. And as your code gets better, you'll see the power numbers going down and down and down. Um, we have, there's one for everybody because when it was, you know, kind of fully online with COVID last year, we actually made this kit that people could take home. Um, this year you'll be expected to get together, I guess. I mean, technically you can do it at home, but there's only one kit per team. Um, but you can do it however you like. So you can work here in the class, you can do it at home as you wish. So let's start with um, the way that you'll enter these devices. So these devices we can program with different languages, obviously. In the end, a microcontroller is just a small processor. There's not like a magic thing here that stops you running Java, for example. It is even possible on an 8-bit microcontroller. Um, but for an easy entry, obviously, it's nice to take something that's well supported. And so the easiest thing we can possibly give you is the Arduino IDE. Um, what is the Arduino IDE? It's good to poke around on the website. Um, the website looks very hardware focused, but today we don't care too much about that. We're going to take a look at the actual programming support. And the first thing I should say about it is, if you're used to like, I don't know, NetBeans or Eclipse, it's not much. You're gonna get a place to write some code. It has this single convention uh, that you have to think, well, that you should think about, setup and loop. And then apart from that, it's just a bunch of libraries with nice names. They make them look as close as they can to Java names, as you'll see as I go forward. So when you write some text to the serial port so that you can see what's happening, it'll look just like you're doing system.out.println, but now you're doing serial.print instead. So it's not a particularly scientifically or educationally interesting way of doing things in its own right, but the good thing is that a lot of people like it. And because a lot of people like it, it means the support in Arduino and examples for almost everything. There's nothing else you could pick up like this, in my opinion, where you could in five minutes find, you know, you want to find a way to put TV out from two pins on this thing. You'll find it online. You want to, like I say, run Java on it. There are seven ways to run Java on this. I don't know, seven. But there's a bunch of ways to run Java on this online. All kinds of crazy stuff. It's all out there. And that makes it really easy to get started. The second thing, though, that I actually really do like about Arduino is it doesn't kind of keep you um, in its little playpen at all. So you're just writing C++ in the end. The libraries look so much like Java, you may occasionally forget which language you're writing. But, you know, you want to put some assembler in there, you just put the assembler in there. You want to uh, start writing in plain C. Well, you know, you have your tool chain from your single install all set up. You can take a look where the uh, compilation happens, and you can just switch smoothly to writing real C. Um, that shortcuts what normally is a ton of effort, getting the cross-compiler set up, getting your configuration parameters right for like compiler optimization, which is never super smooth on these things because basically there's too many of them. So for example, the GCC version of AVR is nowhere near as good as the standard compiler for x86 or for mainstream ARM processors. So all that effort goes away, but it, it really doesn't hold you down. You can manipulate registers directly, switch to regular C, you can connect regular C classes to your C++ Arduino thing, whatever you want to do. So if this if embedded programming sounded a bit scary, by all means stay here. You can get just as good a project result. Uh, if, on the other hand, this looks really kind of naughty to you and like something you don't want to use, that's fine too. 
um, you can you can go and use those other things. Um, so okay, we have our little text editor, which is a nice green color. Um, let's take a little look now. I'll plug in. An, so I'm not going to use the same Arduino as you. It's just because I'm lazy. I had this one on my desk. I was doing something with it. This is actually a um, Bluetooth Arduino, uh, which is kind of neat. And we, we do a whole bunch of things with these, but also kind of interesting to know that, you know, the same ID you can use on your app megas and so on, but also with a Bluetooth chip, with a cellular NB-IoT chip or, or whatever it is that you want. If we take a look in here in tools, um, you can see that when I plugged in my board into the USB, it's recognized it. This is an Adafruit Feather. Not terribly important to you. And you'll also see a reference to a bootloader here. Now, if you start to think back to the memory lecture, you'll recall that on AVR, we have this special bootloader section. And I told you that we could put some software in there that would let us avoid using JTAG. Obviously, no JTAG here, it's just USB. And so in this case, the bootloader, um, which I don't really know, it's this soft device thing, is set up to receive programs that I write in this IDE and compile here. Um, the debug levels are just for the output you're going to get here when you, when you compile and run stuff. And then you have this port setting. So this is important. Um, for both this, for any Arduino, it's going to have some kind of serial to USB bridge on there or a native USB processor with a bootloader. Yours is the latter. Um, which port should it be? Um, I don't know because machines have many ports these days. But there's an interesting way to find out. Obviously, if you unplug it and it goes away, that's your Arduino. This is not uh, dynamic, so you have to go into the menu again. But now you can see my Arduino. Um, one thing I can't show easily here, or maybe I can. Let me try this. I'll show you another board. Um, let's take the tiny mega core. So this is a very different board, um, which, ha which has a lot more options. But if we look in here, I should be able to, yeah. Just take a look how many different things can be supported on here. We have processes that range from like 4K of RAM. I think, actually, I say that. I think it's 4K of flash. 4K of flash and just a few bytes of memory, all the way up to like kind of the classic Arduinos here. In addition, because I'm not all connected up, I can't do it right now. You'll also see settings for oscillators and stuff in here. So for many boards, you'll have the option of using the internal oscillator, the external crystal, and so on and so forth. But OK, let me go back now to the board I'm actually using. Uh, do, 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 do. It's out of fruit, blue fruit feather. Oh, no, it's this one. Sorry. This is the one. OK. Um, I think that does it for the board. Let's write some code. I'll put on, because there's going to be flashing lights and stuff, what I will do is I will also put my camera on so I can show the, um, the Arduino. All right. So, uh, by the way, any questions just to ask? Uh, inevitably, the first program everybody writes with Arduino is going to be Blink. So why Blink? Um, serial ports, you don't have a, a you know, kind of any um, monitor here, obviously, or anything like that. So the simplest thing you can do is to, to blink an LED. So we're going to start with that one. Um, I'm scrolling. For you at home, I think it's a really good idea once you get the kits if, to, to do some of these examples. With the first few, I have no doubt you'll fly through. They're really easy. But as you can see, like if I scroll down here, the amount of um, detail that they put into explaining how to blink an LED is really, really pretty good. More than I'm willing to do here. So for us, we're just going to take this bit of code here. 
Is there a thing to copy it? No, I don't see one, so I'm just gonna scroll down and get the whole thing. Let us paste it into our sketch. Again, there's, it's not a good IDE, to be clear. So you don't get hardly any functions. But honestly, um, in this case, in this case, I don't care about that. And for your assignment, it's not very important. And let's take a look at what we do here. So we now have something in our setup function. The code that goes in setup is all the code on your Arduino that should run once. Um, the code that goes in loop is going to be the code that should run uh, all the time. Why is it a loop? Um, well, there's no, if you do not write a while one loop of some form, your code will execute once and finish. There's nothing to keep, by default, there's nothing to stay alive and responding to here unless you set up interrupts and so on. So for most programs, we're going to have this, this while one loop essentially. Now, why is it not just a while one loop? Why is it this uh, specific um, format? Well, Arduino does a bunch of things under the hood for you. So for example, it has nice things like this delay function right here. Now, you know already that delay must be linked to the ticks of the clock or some other timer on the chip or a programmable interrupt timer, but you don't have to worry about that at the start in Arduino land. It's wrapped up in this nice delay function. So there are a few background things going on by, uh, from the Arduino libraries, and they all get updated in between each call of the loop. So Arduino has its own while one loop somewhere under the hood. It's doing a bunch of stuff, and it's going to call your loop function over and over as it loops. Um, it's quite common for real embedded programmers to, to hate Arduino. That is normal, and think it's very inefficient. The latter is not really true. There's not a ton going on behind the loop function. So eventually, if you have perfect interrupt code, this can even go away. But honestly, especially for you guys, it's not that if you suddenly switch to C, it's going to run twice as fast or anything uh, and write it all yourself. OK, so um, let's get this program on the board. So this, this little button right here, so this, this first button with the checkbox, that will compile it and make sure that it works. Uh, this one will do the same thing and also transmit it to the board. I'll, oh, I have to save it first. No worries. While that's happening, let's take a look at the, the um, actual code in setup. So here we call the pin mode function. We grab a specially named pin. This is why Arduino is nice. I didn't have to look up which pin it was. It has the built-up LED, built-in LED. Normally, to do that, I'd have to go to the schematic online or something and find out. But here, LED built-in is always going to be the same thing. It's your nice, easy-to-control LED. And here, you can see I configure it as an output. So that means that under the hood, this GPIO is being set to drive something. So it's being set to provide power to a thing when I set it to a 1 or a 0, rather than as an input to sense what is going on. That obviously makes sense because it's our LED. I'm going to put it on, put it off. Inside of our loop function, what do we have? We have this nice function, digital write. This is how, in Arduino, you put a value on a pin, on a GPIO pin. And you can see that I am sending the value high. Again, look at the nice constants, right? High and low could have been 1 and 0. I think we could have handled that. But again, it's nice at the start. It's pretty intuitive. You write a high to the built-in LED. We then use the delay function. And by the way, delay is under the hood. Um, it really just waits a certain number of ticks. So this is not going to sleep. Nothing good or clever is happening here. It's just going to block for the right number of ticks to get to 1,000 milliseconds a second. Then we turn the LED off, we wait another second. So, of course, the result is that the built-in LED, that's that one right here, now flashes on and off once a second. Let's make it flash real quick, 10 times a second. Everything will take a minute, so we're compiling. Um, it's sending the uh, uh, code to the bootloader. Now it flashes once every 10 seconds. Remember what we said in the earlier lecture about um, using uh, fast flashing LEDs to, to make different brightness levels? 
To do that uh, well, you should really use pulse width modulation. So that is a function on the chip that does that really fast. I'll try it here, see what happens. Um, we're going to go for a 50% duty cycle. So you can all see how bright it is when it's on. What, let's, let's make this just a millisecond. What I should now have is uh, a 50% brightness LED where you can't see the flashing. A millisecond's plenty fast enough for that. Well, it, that's not the LED here. That's the, uh, the, ser the USB one. And as you can see, you've got a constant kind of brightness LED. You have to trust me that it's half. It should be half, unless there's something weird with the timing code. Okay, let us then make it lower brightness. We'll make this three times as long. Still should be quick enough that your eyes can't see it going on and off. Um, and now we are off three times as long as we are high. So our little LED there should get dimmer once the sketch loads. Again, something I like about this, this little area of computer science is how direct the translation is from concepts to what you see. We talked about like, you know, kind of, uh, is it a third? It is a third, but you guys can't really see the difference probably so great on the camera. Um, so there, there you can see that phenomena that we talked about where we use, in this case, kind of a redneck PWM, because we're not using the right bit on the chip, to, to dim our LED. So that would work equally well. Let me try really, maybe I'll do this nine. Just try and get a really visible difference. The problem is the camera adapts to the brightness, of course. So like you're not really seeing on the screen ground truth at all. So when it's done, you should see a dim LED. It's pretty dim. I don't know. Here it's very visible, but on the camera, again, the camera is like doing smart uh, uh, brightness uh, adjustment. So, so that's your hello world in Arduino. Um, typically, running the Blink program. I hope this is obvious to everyone. That the Arduino IDE, you can download from, from a website. Um, it will auto-detect your board, typically, but you'll also know which one it is. And then you should be able to code this in five minutes, um, is my expectation. Does anyone have any questions or see any worries here? Anything like that? No? Too easy? Okay, let's look at something else. The next thing... Um, that we will go to, which is super useful, is um, our serial read and write. Um, so serial write is very useful for debugging. We're not going to give you guys JTAG programmers and stuff. You're not going to do any of that. So how about if you actually want to say what state your program is in? Well, in that case, we are going to use um, serial uh, write. Here, I don't need to show you the board. We're now going to get some text output. So the device is programmed. Now, when you want to see the serial output from your device, you're going to use the serial monitor thing here, this little icon with the, um, with the magnifying glass. As you can see, stuff is running. It's manically printing out hello and this little dash symbol. I'll come back to that. But let's make this um, a little, ah, this is interesting. So for this serial port thing, you'll notice stuff just got really slow on my machine. That won't happen on your Arduino, but it's some weird uh, effect of the, 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 um, the serial port here. It actually slows down my IDE when it outputs a lot of data. So I'm just going to reset that. Oh, yeah, by the way, so a couple of important buttons here. The reset button, um, if things go wrong, if you hold it down, uh, will stop the code from executing. Um, and you get into a bad state, normally that's what you're going to hit. Most Arduinos have another button just for you to be able to program some button code. I think your device does too. So, okay, let's add a delay here just so it's not so manic. And no, two seconds. Something like that, and we'll flash I have it back. A yeah. Because I was also using the same board. Cool. Um, there's, there was always a problem with the serial, um, the serial monitor that it would disconnect the port, and then it would like just randomly assign it a completely different one. Ah. So is that common practice, or, or is that just a problem with this specific board? 
that's definitely a specific board. Pro so the problem was the serial monitor disconnecting or getting like different ports each time. Yeah, open it before it gets uploaded. It really depends on what you use. So the, the most reliable have like a special serial thing on there and they won't do that at all and it'll always be the same. This one I just mentioned a weird little bug it has where if you send data real fast, my PC runs slow. No clue, uh, but also not very important in the context of this class. The one you guys are using, I think, runs pretty well. I don't think we had any uh, big problems like that. Um, here you can see my, my output code now. It's printing out hello. And let's go back and take a look at the code and see if we can see where, where this little dash comes from. So to set up a serial port, the serial uh, port is real easy. In our setup function, we call serial.begin. This here is the board rate of the serial port. Um, so the board rate is just how fast it runs. In, for, for human output, you know, anything above a few hundred board is going to be fine unless you're printing pages of text to the serial port. Generally, you'll set it you know, um, towards the upper limit of what your board supports. For this weird serial port connection, you can see it's auto-adjusting. So I don't even have it set right here in the serial monitor, but normally you will have to. So for some reason, this thing can auto-board and knows how fast it's running. If you don't have that, then these two things must match. So whatever you put in your code, make sure you have here. Um, otherwise, you'll end up with nonsense. Let me see if I can force it. I don't think so. No. This is annoyingly robust. But normally, if I change that and the value is incorrect, you'll just get garbage. So you ever see garbage here, that probably means this value is not correct. Um, so in the loop here, you can see that we're, we're using this serial.write command um, to, uh, to put stuff on the serial port. What gets displayed here, you have to remember, is ASCII, right? So we can write a byte to the serial port. We do that here. We write the value 45. And you can see that gets rendered right here as this little dash. Um, just something to remember, if you try and output some values from your ADC or whatever and, it, and they come out as weird characters, it's just the ASCII code, that's all. There are methods in Arduino that are really nice, I won't show them now, to do Java-like casting. So it's no problem to do, you know, kind of to make a string from an int and then print that to the serial port. That's all very easy. Let's real quick. Do, and please do ask if you have any questions. Let's real quick do the opposite, and then we'll do some ADC code. So if you want to have some input from the serial port, uh, then you're going to use serial.read. Let me flash that. go through the code while it flashes. So again, we start up the serial port, nothing new there. In our loop now though, you'll see we have this condition, if serial available is greater than zero. So this is, the, this is a, um, um, a way for you to test if somebody has sent you something on the serial port, and under the hood it means that the serial port register has a value in it. Notice it's all byte-wise at the lowest level. But again, Arduino gives you some really nice um, uh, functions to read multiple bytes at a time to print whole strings and so on. Here you can see that we read the next byte from the serial port. Incoming byte is equal to serial.read. Um, and here, you'll notice that an int is used. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the data types on Arduino. You've all had programming classes, so hopefully you can find the right ones for what you're doing. But this can equally be byte. Um, that works fine. Good embedded code, you should obviously be using the you know, variables which are correctly sized for what you're doing. It's not the biggest deal in the world if you use an int versus a byte, um, obviously. Um, but when you get to larger data structures, it does start to become important. So okay, this will block spinning, doing nothing, until this hits a one. So you, your loop is running, you're active. If this is a zero, you excuse me, yes, if this is a zero, you stick here. As soon as it's not, that means you've got something. So we're going to set the incoming byte to the value of that register. You don't have to think about the registers, but that's what's happening. Then we're going to print back to the serial port what it is that we actually received. So let's give it a try. Um, 
I am going to... Is there any static uh, message? No, there's not. So I'll just send something. Let's send a one. And you get, I received 49. Remember ASCII codes. I won't print the ASCII table, but those are... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm entering one, two, three, four, five. If you look at the ASCII codes, that's what you get. Um, are there any questions about talking on the serial port so far? Nice and easy. Good. Okay. Then next, we're going to jump to... Hang on a sec. Um, some digital logic. So let's take a look at digital read. And I think I can just modify this function for my board. Okay, so I'm going to take it easy on myself. And here I'm just going to use the built-in LED. Let me go back to Blink. What was that thing called again? LED built-in. So you know what? I actually don't need this anymore. Uh, in pin, which one do I want? So you'll see, now I start to have to customize. Why? Because I'm going to use some pins to trigger some things. Let's use... Now, again, the naming is quite nice. So normally, what is printed on your board, you can just use directly as a variable here. So I'm going to use... Um, the pin A0, completely random, but I can see the pin A0 right here on the board, so I know which one to use. And you can see that I've set the LED as an output again here, and I've set now this pin A0 to be my input. And um, in my loop method, what I say is that val, uh, th this value I declared before, an integer, is going to be equal to a digital read from A0. What, what can be the values of a digital read, do you think? Uh, who said that? Zero. Yes, zero or one, perfect. Um, if it were an analog read, it would be different. But here we can only ever read a zero or a one. Now you can see that I'm mangling the code a little bit, but uh, who cares? Uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to write to the LED the value uh, that we just read from the input pin. So if the it, what this says is if our input pin here, and actually I need to change that to, if our input pin here, A0, goes high, then the LED should be on. If it goes low, it should be off. Go ahead. You'll get a zero or a one, but you that so on a digital read, if you correctly built the system, that shouldn't happen because you should only use digital read when it's connected to something that gives you binary signals. It can happen, of course, but if it does, um, you don't. You'll get a zero or a one, but you will be getting garbage. So your program could be perfect, but it will not know that that the input is garbage, just like that. So let me just check this real quick. I actually am not using this anymore. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Okay, the LED's my output, that's fine. A naught's my input. I'm going to read A naught and I am going to write that to the LED. That sounds fine. Let's do that. There's no serial code here, so we will only get to see it on the board. And I need a little bit of wire. Am I running already? Yes, I'm running. Good. So this will be tricky to show. Let's start by doing this. So I've now connected my little wire. This is really not very visible. So just trust me to the three volt pin on the Arduino. So that's going to be a high. This is a 3.3 volt Arduino. So I know that if I take that three volts and I connect it to the pin A0, uh, then it's going to be high. So my LED should come on. Really simple bit of code. But as you can see there, like again, we're connecting the digital and the physical worlds. 
Now I have my wonderfully complex bit of wire, and if I jam it into the right socket here, now the light comes on. Let's change this up a bit. Um, how are we going to do this? Let's just do this. I'm going to add some serial port output. Is it begin? I have a ter terrible memory, and I love cut and paste, so honestly, um, I encourage that for you guys, too. Um, yeah, let's do serial.print. And now we're going to do... Hmm, can I do the old Java trick of plus vowel? I think that works. Let's see if it complains. So um, the reason that I do this little bit of nastiness here is, remember, if I write a byte, it's going to write that byte to the serial port, but then I'll get a character code. Arduino also has a nice function. Oh, and you know what? Let's add a carriage return there by making it print len. Arduino also has a um, nice function which will um, uh, print strings. So if I start with a, with a couple of um, quotes here, then Arduino thinks this is a string, and we'll, we'll put my number into the string instead of printing the character code. So, or it should do. I've messed something up somehow. Give me a sec here. Uh, I'm going to add a delay as well. Okay. Oh, actually, let me just try that. Okay, I'm wrong. I actually had it right the first time. Um, I only do that, obviously, to show you that everybody makes mistakes, and you know we should all be willing to show our mistakes. That's the only reason I make coding mistakes. Oh, by the way, check out what just happened when I was making my crap jokes. I accidentally touched the pin, and I get a one all of a sudden. So again, like um, this is supposed to be digital input, but there's no real thing connected here. So like randomly kind of mashing it or moving it can generate the odd one in reference to the question from before. OK, so um, let's change this up a bit, and we will just do an analog read now. I want to stop triggering the LED now that I can see the value here. And I just want us to take a look at um, what analog values we get out of the same pin. I'm lucky on this board because I can use the same pin for analog and digital. It's not always so, but it makes my demo convenient. So now you'll notice that we get um, you know, a, a, no, a value that is not 0 or 1. Um, it's pretty low. Um, what would we, so this is a 10-bit ADC we have on this device. That means we have 2 to the power 10 as our maximum range. So 60 is pretty low. It's not zero. Uh, there's some voltage on that pin uh, that's sensed, uh, but, but it's certainly a low voltage. Let me see. Now, I wouldn't really expect this to give uh, a super sensible value. Um, it can be that in a noisier environment, if you were to connect at the same thing, it might oscillate wildly because, again, there's nothing connected here, right? So what should the voltage be? Well, it's going to go up and down depending on what's, what's around in the environment. So same kind of thing now. Let me connect. Let's begin with ground. Why not? What's the value going to be when I connect ground to this thing? Around the same. Yep, indeed. Well, a little bit lower. We have now a clean ground. Remember that these things are, it's all relative, right, as well. So on, on our ADC, um, the, the, the bottom value is relative to the board's ground. So normally if I connect ground, you will get a clean zero. 
Um, because, again, everything is relative to that. It may not really be zero, but that's the best we can do. That's the best we can see. Now, luckily for me, I can also see I have a 3-volt pin here. So, not the exact number, but what would you expect to see if I connect? This is a 3.3-volt board. If I were to connect the 3-volt pin, what would you expect to see, roughly? It's only a 10-bit ADC, so we go up to 1,024. We should see about 90% of that range, roughly. And we see about 90% of that range. Um, so there you have using the, the analog input. It's only a short step to the, from there to using um, things like resistive temperature sensors. So if you, if you have like the right kind of material that I'm putting on this wire instead of just a straight wire, then you could use the uh, registered voltage um, to, to measure the temperature, for example. It's how a lot of sensors work under the hood. Okay, Let, let's see, we did the ADC. I'm gonna finish, I think, with the interrupts. Um, actually, Matty's in in two minutes, so I'll finish really quickly with the interrupts. Do, do, do. Let's see if I can make this work in two minutes. All of these are good things to try at home, for sure, once you get your boards. They're, they're real easy. I think they're kind of fun. Um, and even if they're not fun, they're over quickly. Oops. OK, let's change these pins. Uh, lead pin is going to be built-in lead. That's lead. Built-in? Yes. Our interrupt pin, we're going to stick with A0. Volatile. Note here the declaration of volatile. This is a super simple interrupt example, but remember, if you don't tag your global variables as volatile, then the compiler can like factor them out because it thinks they're never used and stuff like this. So you got to have the volatile keyword. Okay, so uh, okay, this will work now. Lead pin is output. Interrupt pin has a pull-up connected. Who can remember what the pull-up is for? Yeah, indeed, it gives it a defined state. So it means that if nothing is happening, it's going to be high. So I have to pull it low in order to make a trigger. If you didn't set anything, then it will bounce around. And in this case, the lead may come on randomly. We now attach an interrupt. This is, cre this is attaching an interrupt handler. It means the memory location of the function digital pin to, excuse me, I should say the function blink is entered into the interrupt vector. You can see here that there is um, also um, a condition. The chip supports interrupts that are due to changes from one state to another, going high, going low, rising edges, falling edges. You can find those in the data sheet. Different chips might support different kinds of change here. So uh, digital pin to interrupt is the interrupt pin uh, what was that? A zero. That's fine. So on a change, my lead should come on. Yes. Good. Let's do it. This is almost certainly not going to work because I don't have time to fix it. But let us see. So the device is programmed. Um, and now I'm going to start by hooking up 3 volts to my interrupt pin A0. What should happen? Nothing. Remember, it's connected to a pull up, so its default state is high. I want to make it change. I've got to pull it low. So I have my nice ground pin here. And instead, I will now pull that interrupt line low. Oops. And you can see that my lead, if I can hold the thing right, will come on. But remember, we configured it for change, right? So it will come on when I press it, and it will go off when I trigger it. I'm sorry for my awful camera work. So, so it's really, th those are like the simplest examples. But here you can see we already, we kind of shot through those lectures. We've used a bootloader, which goes back to the memory lectures. Uh, we've not used any registers here, just for due to time. But we can also look at the serial port registers to see the data coming in and stuff. 
And now we've also done our interrupts. Um, I think if you can go through those exercises at home, you'll be in great shape. Okay, and I think that brings us to the end. Any questions? No? Okay, then I will see you next week. <laughs>